So thank you guys. Thank you to everyone who's attending today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, so this is our first virtual seminar um, that we have for the uh, spring 2016 semester. And we're happy to have um, two speakers today. Um, Mark Ferrari is the Director of Operations for Blueprint Healthcare IT. And Ryan Patrick is the Director of Security, Privacy, and Compliance. And today they're going to be speaking on Mass Casualty Incidents, Combat, and Corporate Compliance. So without further ado, uh, Mark and Ryan, you can take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, I appreciate, first of all, everyone uh, kind of bearing with us while we uh, figured out the audio uh, difficulties. Um, having gone through this program myself, I know that uh, sometimes the technical difficulties get in the way. So thanks for waiting and appreciate you coming out today to, to listen to us. Um, just to go over the agenda real quick, uh, I'll introduce myself and, and, and Ryan, um, and then we'll kind of set the stage for um, the environment that we operate in. Uh, at Blueprint Healthcare IT and um, kind of give you a little bit of background on the, um, the need for readiness and preparedness uh, and why it's um, it's been an area in which some of the, the same types of tools and constructs that, that uh, all of us in emergency management tend to uh, associate with and use uh, frequently. So we'll talk about applying the tabletop exercise uh, in particular and talk about some of the success we've seen with that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, try and leave uh, about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so if you have them, uh, please kind of hang on to them. We'll go through the presentation and, and at the end we'll, uh, we'll get moving with the questions. So just to introduce myself, um, I'm the Director of Operations for Blueprint Healthcare IT. Um, and for the past 15 years I've been in project and program management. Uh, ops management and uh, very heavily in the past uh, recent years in security program governance. Um, a former uh, Air Force officer, um, commanded uh, Minuteman 2 and missile, Minuteman 3 uh, missile crews. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of that experience that goes into uh, what we do today in terms of information security um, because, as you can imagine, uh, the, the uh, maturity of the security program around um, nuclear weapons and classified information in general is it, pretty robust. So um, I, I, I still borrow from those days, even though they're, they're very far in the rear view. Um, I've, I've also uh, have uh, 20 plus years in emergency services on the volunteer side. Uh, I've been a firefighter EMT all that time. Um, and like most volunteers, I've worn several different hats in, in several different companies. Uh, so I won't bore you with that. Um, I've, um, I've spent some time in, uh, also in a volunteer capacity uh, as an emergency manager um, for Wallace Township out in Chester County, uh, with a business degree from Villanova, uh, and uh, in 2013 finished my uh, emergency management uh, master's degree uh, from Millersville um, and holds certifications uh, in project management and in uh, healthcare information security. Um, First thing I want to just kind of stop and see, uh, Chris, is the is the audio okay? Am I coming through okay? Yeah, it, it's sounding perfect. So. Okay, great, great. So uh, the other reason I wanted to introduce myself first is because uh, I didn't want to follow Ryan because he's a lot cooler than I am. So uh, I'll, Ryan, I'll pass it. Uh, actually, um, I want to go into a little bit. Um, about uh, my background with with tabletop exercises. Um, I typically have used them in, in emergency services, um, most uh, notably in, um, in using it to prepare for a mass casualty incident, a full-scale regional exercise. Um, about the end of, I think, the summer of 2009, um, we, uh, we had a mass casualty incident on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which, you know, had, it had its ups and downs in terms of how it was handled. And so um, my company, uh, myself and a fellow officer, organized a regional uh, mass casualty incident involving uh, two different hospitals, uh, 10 uh, response agencies, uh, uh, just that helicopter that you see there. Um, and our uh, drill kicked off 
uh, drills at Paoli Hospital and at Brandywine Hospital in Chester County. Uh, that helicopter that you see there in the picture it actually uh, brought the first helicopter-borne patient to Paoli Hospital since it was certified as a trauma center. So this exercise, uh, you know, kind of had a trickle-down effect. Um, but before we went into the time-consuming and expensive um, side of, of a full-scale field exercise, um, we, we utilized the tabletop to basically ensure everyone was on the same page and that the situation would would be uh, would go well and we'd get the most out of it. Um, and so that's that's kind of my background with tabletops, you know, kind of a more traditional um, experience with them, as I'm sure a lot of you have. Now I'll hand it over to uh, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so that really handsome guy over there, no, that's not Mark, that's me. Um, just kidding. So uh, I have a very broad experience uh, within the security and uh, privacy arena, uh, both in the private and public sectors. I started off my career uh, as an armor officer in the United States Army, so I got to be really cool and ride around on tanks, uh, and uh, I was able to uh, deploy in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, from uh, March of 2003 to uh, March of 2004, so I was there from the beginning uh, very interesting experiences, uh, was able to apply the principles of the tabletop exercise while in combat, which we'll talk about a little bit in uh, further slides. I'm currently still a major with the United States Army Reserve. Uh, I work at the Special Operations Command at McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida uh, as part-time. Uh, previously, I was the Chief Information Officer for the 42nd Infantry Division in the New York National Guard. Uh, in that role, uh, I was uh, a part of several active duty responses, including the response for Superstorm Sandy, uh, Tropical Storm Irene, and then the very significant uh, winter snowstorm of uh, 2014 where they saw 80 plus inches drop in, in uh, about 36 hours. Uh, again, the reason why I bring these up is that we use the tabletop exercises to plan uh, and respond for each one of these types of events. I also spent a significant amount of time working for the FEMA Region 2 Homeland Response Force, what that organization uh, was designed to do, it's congressionally uh, mandated, is uh, plan and respond to any homeland uh, disasters or uh, terrorist attacks. So our planning scenario uh, was a 10 kiloton uh, nuclear detonation in downtown Manhattan and how we would respond to that. Needless to say, uh, it, it's a pretty significant uh, undertaking using that scenario and planning against it. Uh, so we utilize tabletop exercises very, very frequently to vet the plan that we had come up with on how to respond uh, in a multitude of different ways. Uh, I currently hold the Certified Information System Security Professional Certification and I have also uh, attained an MBA from Norwich University in Vermont. Mark, next slide, please. So here, here are a couple pictures, and, and I'm not going to really dive into them uh, in detail, but this was uh, in Iraq in 2003. Uh, this was later in my deployment, about eight months in, uh, when we first had uh, arrived in country. Uh, it was very uh, conventional in the way the combat operations were going, but as time uh, kind of unfolded, the insurgents started using uh, more diverse tactics, uh, specifically using improvised explosive devices, which wasn't something that the Army was necessarily prepared to deal with. So what you're looking at here was uh, I was utilizing the tabletop exercise to train um, senior leaders of my unit on the appro appropriate response to an IED attack while on the street or patrolling. Uh, so basically we, we used the sand table that you see there with the cool little trucks um, to talk about actions when the incident would happen, uh, subsequent actions based on the personnel that would be uh, responding, and then ultimately how would we uh, close out the response effort. So that it was an effective use of an exercise without actually having to go out 
onto the streets of Iraq in practice. So we actually did this within the uh, safety of our forward operating base into Crit Iraq. Actually, you can't see them in any of these pictures, but we are uh, hundreds of feet away from one of Saddam's biggest palaces uh, in the country of Iraq. So it, it, it just proves the, the uh, fact that tabletop exercises can be used wherever, whenever, in order to vet plans and operations. Next slide. Okay, so a uh, little bit uh, about the title. You know, part of it was, was shameless and that we wanted to grab attention uh, because I don't think, uh, you know, sitting in a conference room talking about corporate compliance is, is going to really draw draw an audience. Um, but what it's really designed to do is, and, you know, as, as Ryan and I just kind of mentioned, um, it's designed to underscore um, how effective and applicable some of the tools of emergency management can be. Um, in settings that you otherwise wouldn't think of using them in. Uh, and specifically in our uh, experience, the tabletop exercise has really been a, a valuable one and one that, uh, frankly, our client base has, has been thrilled with. Um, and to that end, what we're talking about is security compliance. And we'll get into uh, a little bit about our day-to-day -day and some of the things our clients face uh, and give you a little background on that so that you understand why um, why they would uh, engage in tabletop exercises. Um, so our, our health, our basic client is uh, healthcare typically, uh, and what you're seeing here are, are standard healthcare scenes. Um, but what Ryan and I can see as well are uh, a few gaping uh, vulnerabilities when it comes to information security. Um, so we, uh, you know, we we take our clients through scenarios with tabletops. To help them understand how to how to better uh, set up their posture. Uh, so, just some background on our day to day. Um, our primary, our kind of bread and butter, is performing vulnerability and risk assessments um, in terms of information security. Um, one thing that is important to underscore is that information security does not uh, solely mean uh, network based or technical security. It's it's the security of all information. Uh, within an organization, and we take a very holistic approach. Uh, so you can see we do technical test scanning, but we also review uh, documentation, we do interviews, uh, we do physical inspections, uh, and we're looking at not only um, information uh, security at that point, but physical security and environmental systems. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Um, overall, we, we work to develop enterprise risk management programs and, and assist with remediation of vulnerabilities. Um, to give you a quick background on information security, just so you, you have some better context, um, there are three core elements, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, confidentiality is what we all think of when we think of information security, keeping people who shouldn't access certain information from accessing it. Um, integrity, of course, we want to make sure that only those people who are authorized to change a record can do so. Uh, and then availability, is really where disaster recovery and business continuity come into play. Um, if you think about, you know, as is our client base, if you think about um, medical records, uh, you certainly want your medical record to be confidential. You certainly want only your doctor or a clinician to be able to change it, um, and you all and you want that record to be available to your doctor when he or she treats you. Um, and so, if if all three of those aren't in place, there's a problem. And I'll kind of go into why compliance is critical, and, and that kind of speaks to why our clients would, would pay for us to do tabletop exercises, um, because in the end, it's, a, it's an expenditure of theirs, both in fees and in their people's time. Um, in the healthcare industry, and this is kind of uh, an eye-opener, even from an emergency management standpoint, um, there's a, there's a, a really uh, precipitous increase in crimes uh, aimed at obtaining healthcare information. Um, we typically think of identity theft and, and uh, information, uh, personal information being stolen in terms of our credit cards. Um, but if, uh, if, if, for example, a credit card number is worth $10 on the black market, uh, a medical record, medical record information is going to be worth $100. Um, and there's reasons behind that. Um, you, can, you can basically use a credit card number to make purchases fraudulently. 
with health care information, you can fraudulently bill uh, Medicare and Medicaid, you can access narcotics, you can access health care under an assumed identity. Uh, and so those are, from a criminal standpoint, the gifts that keep on giving. And uh, so health care information uh, is highly sought after. Health care organizations are by and large soft targets at this point. Uh, and so that's, uh, that makes them uh, more heavily preyed upon. Uh, breaches can result in uh, financial damage. Uh, and if you think about the, the average uh, amount of records that could be lost on, uh, let's say, a laptop that's stolen or a thumb drive that gets uh, stolen or, or that even in you know, one single box of medical records, um, if you think about a figure of over $360 per record, uh, that can add up very quickly. There's also reputational damage um, in that there are studies out there that suggest that if, uh, if you know, my hospital has experienced a, uh, a breach of their healthcare data, um, that I'm, you know, that there are people that are more inclined to go to a different hospital. Uh, and in, in the competitive nature of healthcare these days, that's a problem. Um, but above all else, patient safety is, is is why it's such a critical issue. Um, if, if someone steals your credit card, you simply call up your credit card company and you get another one reissued. If someone steals your medical identity, they're going to access health care. They're going to they're uh, feign certain illnesses. They're going to say they're on certain medications. Um, all of that now becomes part of your medical record. So the next time you go to um, access health care, there's incorrect information, so the integrity of that record has been compromised. That's going to potentially result in misdiagnosis, mistreatment, or a delay in treatment. That's kind of a scary concept, uh, and, and that's, that's gaining um, more and more awareness in the industry, which is why healthcare organizations are, are focusing more heavily on security. Real quick, some of the threats, um, you know, with standard theft, um, but there are also things called advanced persistent threats. Um, the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army has a specific unit uh, dedicated to, to uh, waging war, uh, cyber warfare on Western industry, particularly U.S. companies. Uh, we see that with our client base. We can tell how many times their networks have been scanned by uh, unauthorized um, sources, and it's you know the the, the statistics can be staggering. Um, one of the more troubling uh, recent developments is something called medjacking, uh, in which um, many pacemakers that are actually implanted into patients have a Bluetooth control element, um, and a lot of IV pumps uh, on hospital floors are attached to the network, uh, usually uh, in a wireless fashion. Both those types of devices are susceptible to being um, taken over by a criminal actor which is kind of a disturbing development. Um, so not only do our client base have to, does our client base have to deal with um, standard contingencies of fires, flood, and other disasters, but they have this increasing criminal element that they have to prepare themselves for. And Ryan, I'll pass it over to you because that's really why you know, they get into uh, uh, pursuing a greater state of readiness. And again, tabletops are a way in which we've, we've tried to help them do that. Ryan, you may be muted, so. Thank you. A little bit of an audio issue there. Uh, so tabletop participants uh, are there for a, a number of reasons. You know, they, they may need to resp respond to contingencies, ensure availability information, or even operations, uh, maintain the integrity of information, uh, maintain confidentiality, more touched on those. Uh, but they also need to coordinate activities. So when you come together uh, to conduct an exercise such as this, uh, it's it's just as much about learning the plan as identifying gaps in the plan. Uh, so the exercises themselves can contain numerous different entities uh, within the exercise. So it could be, uh, say, one organization with cross-functional departments. Uh, you know, you could have HR in there, facilities. Uh, if, if it's a hospital system, it could be, you know, radiology, the ED. Uh, it really it should span uh, the breadth of anybody who is a part of whatever plan you're trying to vet. 
Uh, everybody should be coming to the table and participating in that plan. And really, it doesn't have to be about technology. It could be technology agnostic. I can tell you from my experience in, uh, in the, the military, we did a lot of tabletop exercises that had nothing to do with technology. And that's, that's kind of the great thing about a TTX is that uh, it really can be applied across the board. Uh, you see it very heavily in government. Uh, you see it very heavily in, in uh, emergency management and the military. Uh, and I think it's starting now to gain traction in other industries in the sense that it's, it's a low-cost solution. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not as labor-intensive, if you will, where you, a full-scale exercise or a full-scale drill, you need to bring everybody who's going to participate in that. Well, that disrupts day-to-day -day operations. And, you know, work kind of stops at that point when you do a full-scale exercise. So it's a low-cost solution. You know, everybody comes into a conference room and you just start having a conversation. It doesn't take a whole lot of coordination um, to, to bring those people together and have that, that, that conversation. One of the other things that it needs to have as a benefit is it needs to be informal. So people need to feel comfortable that they can kind of highlight shortcomings or gaps in the plan itself without retribution. Uh, so if, if the facilitator is able to kind of set the stage that, hey, this is all about improving the plan and get people uh, relaxed, that's where you're really going to see the magic happen. You know, people are going to start talking about their piece of the pie uh, and how it relates to the overall plan. Uh, and, and really, that's what you want to happen, um, is, is getting those conversations that the facilitator doesn't have to prompt uh, between these cross-functional departments uh, to see where uh, either, you know, Department A, say HR, doesn't know what, uh, you know, finance is doing or vice versa. Uh, it, now both departments have a good solid understanding of what each other's role is with that particular plan. Uh, one, uh, one, one saying that I learned in the emergency management world is you don't want to be training, trading business cards at the incident site, meaning that if the incident's happening and you're meeting the people that you need to, do, to work with for the first time at the incident site, it's too late. You should have already met them beforehand, and that's another benefit that a, a tabletop exercise gives you, is you get to understand what players are involved, what their roles are, what their personalities are, because personality plays a lot uh, when executing plans. So it gives people that, that opportunity to meet each other, because in very large organizations, even mid-sized organizations, people can work for years without ever meeting a person that they would have to work with uh, say in healthcare with some kind of incident response, whether it's a breach or a catastrophic power failure, you, you wouldn't even know what their email is or their phone number. Whereas when you, when you organize a tabletop exercise, everybody's in the same room, everybody can shake hands, trade business cards. Now you, now you have a face to, to associate with their part of the plan and how they're going to exercise it. And then ultimately, uh, there's a training value in doing tabletop exercises. And we'll get into this a little bit more, more in future slides, uh, but Mark and I did a tabletop exercise at, at a hospital system where uh, it was clear that the participants in listening to their co-participants were learning more about the overall plan and not just what their piece of the plan kind of covers. So there's a training benefit to this. And again, very low cost, very low labor. You're, you're, you're bringing the team together in a very informal manner. Next slide, please, Mark. Okay, so I mentioned that the that TTXs can be applied really any way, in any shape, in any form. Uh, and we're going to talk about two uh, so, somewhat similar but different types of applications that we've done recently. One is uh, uh, kind of a more common tabletop exercise. We did it for an acute care hospital and or health system uh, where we were looking specifically at their disaster recovery plan, their business continuity plans. Um, and we'll get into actually the, the, the facilitation of that exercise in later slides. But we also did another very interesting exercise out in the Kansas City region where it was multiple uh, facilities, multiple organizations that had a common uh, interest in the mental health community 
Uh, so what they were trying to do is they were trying to vet their uh, processes to make sure that everybody understood what the process was between all these organizations, specifically passing a patient from one organization to the next to provide care uh, and the technologies that were involved with that. So it was, a, it was a pretty big undertaking in the sense that we had five separate sites that we were trying to pull together. Uh, we had to develop mock patients uh, using uh, de-identified data uh, and then obviously we had to try to bridge the gaps technologically in order to still take the exercise. Next slide, please, Mark. And so, so with the, uh, the, the example that Ryan mentioned um, that will go into uh, some of the actual steps of the, uh, or some of the actual injects uh, for that tabletop, um, the example that we'll go into in more detail is the, is the health system um, example. Um, and just to give you some background on, on that client, um, uh, they're a uh, northeastern United States-based uh, uh, health system with multiple acute care facilities, uh, one of them being a trauma center uh, and associated physician practices. Um, they're in a uh, large metropolitan area and uh, adjacent to a commercial airport, which you'll see why is uh, relevant very shortly. Um, and our task was, uh, as part of a vulnerability and risk assessment, uh, to test and stress their business continuity and disaster recovery plans and, and evaluate um, their constructs to keep it, uh, to ensure information security practices throughout and following an event. Um, and, uh, you know, so in, in putting together this tabletop, um, you know, both myself and Ryan uh, were, you know, really um, trying to incorporate all the, all the, the experience we've had with them in other venues to make it a really robust and, and, and uh, valuable uh, exercise for them. So the, um, the exercise objectives um, basically were to um, review IT support and, and, and processes and procedures when they would uh, contact vendors uh, to support their systems, um, what their downtime procedures are, how does, it, how does the health system operate when uh, key infrastructure is down, uh, how do they return to a state of normalcy? Um, and then also, uh, not only from an IT perspective, but how does the, the outage then affect other areas, clinical areas such as nursing, pharmacy, lab, et cetera, um, and when and how does emergency management for that health system get involved? Uh, our exercise participants in this case, um, we had a, a decent amount of non-IT uh, representation lab patient access, which is really the registration staff, uh, radiology, nursing informatics, uh, pharmacy, uh, and we also had representation from emergency management. Uh, from IT, we had some management, uh, network engineers, uh, people from the data center. Um, and then we had, uh, of course, uh, Ryan acting as an exercise facilitator um, with, uh, with me there as well, uh, kind of assisting with that. Um, and some of the key things to point out in terms of, uh, you know, the, the duties of the exercise facilitator um, and some of the things to keep in mind when facilitating uh, is, number one, um, you want to continually ask uh, probing questions to encourage additional discussion. Um, you know, you want to have a scripted set of injects and, and kind of actions that you're looking to see if, uh, if they're going to take place or not. Um, but you also want to be able to kind of go off the paper a little bit and ask, um, probing questions on the fly to ensure that you're, you're kind of uncovering the types of uh, potential um, vulnerabilities or, or uh, maybe um, gaps in process that could exist. Um, but amid that, you also have to keep the exercise on track and, and on time. Um, and, and the key is not to coach your participants into uh, certain actions. Um, if, if a certain uh, participant just flat out blows it and doesn't, uh, doesn't even bring up some key things that he or she should, given their area uh, of responsibility, uh, then in terms of the tabletop exercise, that's a victory because you've now uncovered uh, a, a large gap and, and better to uncover it at that point than during a real event, obviously. Um, and then, of course, you also want to have a scribe if you have the manpower available um, and, and uh, and make sure you record things uh, as the exercise goes. 
So Ryan, I'll pass it back to you to kind of yeah, absolutely. So in, in this specific uh, exercise, we we brought the team into a conference room. Uh, we had all the logistical things set up with projectors and what have you. But the first thing we did is we kind of set the tone uh, with the exercise objectives, why we were there, uh, understand the exercise workflow. So really what we were trying to do is, is get everybody on the same page to even start the discussion. Uh, so what we did, is, as Mark said, is we had a script that we had written based on uh, that organization's disaster recovery and business continuity plan. So we asked, we requested that plan up front, and then we wrote the exercise against that plan. Now, truth be told, the, the design of the exercise was not only to test, but stress the, the organization in the sense that we wanted to get them out of their comfort zone. So you're going to see as we run through some of these injects uh, where we were looking to get them out of their comfort zone, because when when we get them out of their comfort zone, that's where it kind of gets the juices flowing and people's minds start spinning on things that they may not have thought about. Uh, you know, it may identify you know areas that could be improved. Uh, so we we I don't want to say we throw things out that may be unrealistic, but what we do is we kind of layer the the uh, issues, the stress, if you will right on top of each other and just keep the pressure on because ultimately we want people to be thinking, we want it to spur a conversation. Uh, the facilitators themselves, as Mark said, should not be giving the answers to the test, if you will. Uh, facilitators are doing exactly what the, the, the name says. They should be facilitating the conversation. If there's a, if there's a lull, uh, then they need to be asking questions in order to get that conversation spurred back up. Uh, but those are very specific questions that the facilitator may already have um, kind of written down based on what they know of the plan and what they know of the organization. Some of, the, some of those questions may come up through the discussion. So the facilitator is really a, a, key, a key ingredient to the success of the exercise. So in this particular exercise, we, we laid out the scenario, kind of painted the picture, gave them the time and the place. Uh, and then we proceeded to just throw quote unquote injects at them, which basically are additional pieces of information uh, that they would see in a real world scenario that they would have to react to. So in this scenario, uh, basically the hospital uh, had a, uh, a system that went down. Uh, the system administrator was currently working on it, uh, and the issue was unknown at the time. So immediately uh, we were looking for the effect. So or we were trying to demonstrate the effect. So they can't register patients, they can't discharge patients, no orders were getting out, no results were coming in. That's ultimately the feeling that we were trying to invoke in the participants. And what we what we did is we wrote out expected actions. So these were the things we wanted the the conversation to kind of cover. Uh, so this, again, is where that facilitator, uh, if these points were not covered, then they're going to ask questions to try to get the group to focus on those things. So one thing we wanted to do is we wanted the management team to determine a trigger point or a threshold as to when to call a vendor. And again, this is very scenario specific. Uh, these expected actions will be specific to the scenarios that you may come across or develop. So we wanted a trigger point. Uh, immediately we wanted downtime procedures to be initiated. Uh, and then we had questions in there, and you'll see at the bottom where we we were looking for very specific information. So we may use that um, through the conversation. Next slide, please. So this is where we kind of layer the stress in. So not only did their their main uh, registration system go down with a couple of ancillary systems, now we have just compounded the issue because uh, we have built into the scenario that an aircraft at a neighbor or nearby airport uh, landed short of the runway. And not only are there injuries on the plane, but it also hit several vehicles on a road that uh, ran around the airport. So we were, we were telling them that, okay, you have your normal hospital intake and outtake of patients. Well, now it's going to get compounded because we just had an air, aircraft crash. Uh, and they were anticipating both ambulatory and non-ambulatory ca uh, casualties. So really what we want to do now 
what we were trying to drive at at this point was we wanted the team, the participants, to start thinking about, okay, now we have an additional increase in uh, intake. Is there anything we need to change in the way we conduct our downtime procedures in order to compensate for that? So again, it's all about getting the juices flowing. So another point that, that is kind of critical to a well-vetted scenario is it, there has to be relevant details uh, about the, the scenario that you're writing. So we could have just stopped at, hey, there's a, there's a plane that crashed, uh, crashed into a couple of cars, there's a lot of patients coming your way. And any good hospital system would be like, okay, so where are they going and how many are coming to me? What is the, the what are the details? Those typical questions that they would be asking of the, the emergency management team uh, in order to prepare. So we, we actually added very specific details. Now we didn't give these to them outright. We waited for them to come across this on their own and then we would have the answer. And this, these are the details that really make an exercise run efficiently because it, it gives the, the participants the idea that the scenario is real and something they can expect. So again, we had expected actions uh, and uh, desired effects. So the next inject was uh, very, it was more technology uh, focused, talking about how the database of their registration system had been restored, um, but there's still additional work that had to be done. So now what we are looking at is what, are there any special considerations now because this has now become a long-term outage. It's, it's now uh, going to result in at least 10 plus hours of an outage. So do they have long-term downtime procedures? What are the considerations of those downtime procedures? Because now they went to paper records, right? So how are, we, how are they compensating for that additional paper sitting everywhere? Not only from a, an operational perspective, but from a security perspective. And you'll see in this slide uh, the expected actions. We wanted them to start talking about how do they track that, those paper records? Because now that is patient sensitive information that could walk away. Uh, is there specific security uh, procedures around storing those documents, uh, couriering those documents? So we were looking to get them thinking about all those second and third order effects of this is now a long term outage on their registration system. What do they need to be thinking about? And then there's some of the, the, the typical things, okay, uh, you know, now they need to start notifying the organization that this is now a long-term issue and it, the, the fixed time frame uh, has not yet been determined. So people kind of need to start thinking about, hey, are there shift changeover uh, considerations that need to be taken into account, need to be thought of? You know, so we're at, we're at the 8 to 10 hour mark now, a new shift may be coming on, how are we transitioning this, this incident over to the, the new shift? What pertinent information do we have to be telling them? Next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of where we wrap the, the exercise up. Um, it's 18 hours after the, uh, the initial scenario, the initial inject. Uh, what we're looking for now is, okay, You've, you've had 18 hours, including a plane crash, several car crashes, uh, worth of patients coming through the door. How are you going to play catch up with all that, that paper information and getting it back into your EHR, or your EMR, uh, so there is some continuity there and, and, and you can use that information in the future. So we looked at it from not only a network perspective, hey, is there threading considerations, meaning that if everybody tries to go to the EHR at the same time, it's going to slow down and or stop. So do you phase that updating of the system so that not everybody is, is trying to reach it at the same time? Maybe uh, patient registration is the first one to go in so they can get all the paper records uh, into the registration system and then, you know, so on and so forth down the line, which departments in which order at what time for how long. Uh, how do you communicate that this is now operational to the organization? Again, do you want to tell everybody at the same time so everybody's going out there or do you want to phase it? Uh, and then the actual working of the, uh, 
paper documents getting digitized, what is that process? How is that going to work? Do they, is there, is there financial considerations? Maybe they need to bring people in or pay people overtime in order to play catch up. Is anybody thinking about the financial aspect of this? So again, these are, these are things that on the surface people may not be thinking about, but in the, through the use of a tabletop exercise, uh, you can start to bring these things to light, especially with a really good facilitator. Hey, did anybody think about bringing in people for overtime to get all these paper, paper records uh, inputted? What are the, the cost projections on that? Is that something we can afford? Is it only a handful of people? What's the plan? Because ultimately that needs to be built into the plan so if this ever does happen, it's less of an impact and there's already a procedure that someone can follow. Next slide. And then ultimately the, the, the exercise wraps up with everybody's caught up, every, all the paper records have been handled. Uh, what we were looking for uh, is demonstration of a mature organization in the sense that we want them to think about how they're going to analyze this incident and be better prepared for it next time. So this is a, this is a part of you know managing a plan, measuring a plan, and managing a plan uh, to make sure that it's still relevant and it's being improved over time continuously. So. Is there going to be some kind of formal post-incident review of the incident? Uh, are lessons learned going to be from, uh, applied? And then how is that application actually going to take place? Is it something you know, at the executive level? Uh, is it driven at the lower levels? Really, that's organizationally dependent. Uh, but again, those, those, those things have to be talked about in order for the organization to get better. Next slide. And, uh, so it, some of the lessons learned uh, specifically uh, from this exercise was uh, the first one was that uh, nursing informatics, and, and basically that's a, you know, for, for those not familiar with healthcare, that's a, a, a group um, of uh, nurses uh, within a health system that are uh, more in tune with uh, information technology and uh, in terms of uh, measuring and, and managing um, systems from a nursing perspective. Um, so they um, usually uh, just walk the floors during um, extended downtimes uh, to make sure things are running smoothly. Um, but that's not really part of their, their documented process. It's just something that because the folks that are at this particular facility, um, they've been there long enough and it's just something they do. Uh, it's a great practice, but you know, if those people were to leave, that practice would leave with them. So adding that to their standard process uh, was a takeaway. Um, one interesting uh, factor we had, and as Ryan said, the more you get people talking, the more you get those juices flowing, you, you, you will uh, happen upon some of these gems that, that uh, you know, the exercise is designed to uh, elicit. Um, the radiology uh, representatives thought, hey, you know, this is, this is all great, but where was it when we had we lost our server because of a flooded server closet? Um, what, so what we found was that this organization's uh, response was was a generally a very good one um, for large scale incidents, but there were some missing trigger points for isolated incidents that, for a specific department, were very critical, but for the organization overall may not have been as big. Um, so before the exercise, there was really no common awareness of that of that issue, and so that was a that was a great takeaway. Um, one of the other things was that the lab system, uh, even though these systems were down, they have an offline capability, so they could still technically use their system uh, and enter data right into it. Uh, they didn't need to rely on the interoperability of other systems, uh, which during the scenario was down, um, and so. The, uh, the IT department um, is now kind of looking into can they, uh, can they have uh, similar functionality in their ED system and their radiology system. Um, so some, some good uh, concrete takeaways. Overall, to kind of wrap up our conversation before questions is, you know, our, our recommendations uh, when doing tabletops, um, first and foremost, um, physically check the location where you're going to hold it before the event. 
Um, in the case of the Kansas City uh, exercise, uh, Ryan and I drove, literally drove to each of the five facilities the day before, um, and it was a good thing we did because, number one, we got to uh, interact with uh, the main point of contact at each area and kind of help set expectations and also val uh, validate, um, you know, that all the necessary infrastructure was there. Uh, also, as Ryan said, create a scenario that's specific to the participants and that has a lot of detail. Um, and again, make it fun, make it non-retributional because you want people to feel um, okay uh, maybe airing things that aren't quite perfect uh, because that's that's the point of the whole uh, exercise. That's not as easy as it sounds. Um, so the more you can stress that, uh, the better. Um, make sure that uh, folks have uh, a list of the resources that they should bring um, to the exercise. We had... Uh, Quite a few participants in this exercise bring uh, binders that were several inches thick uh, of their um, of their uh, uh, downtime procedures and uh, and whatever other forms they needed. Um, as Ryan said, uh, ask probing questions uh, as the facilitator. Um, open the exercise with crown rules. Um, and then one thing uh, at the end is to ask for feedback at the conclusion. Um, we have feedback forms that we get. Um, and uh, um, we we uh, we got some very good feedback from that. Um, and then also capture process improvements um, as you go along uh, as the exercise unfolds, um, and if, if possible, how to scribe. Um, and that really uh, concludes the presentation. I would love to go into some questions now. Um, and uh, Chris, I don't know how you want to go through those. Uh, or if people, you know, if there's a way to raise hands yeah, or whatever. So um, we'll just open it up for questions. So if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand or even type it in the chat box. So Courtney has a question for you all. Um, her question is, many of us will be in entry level positions as we enter the workforce. In these positions, how do we go about convincing our organizations to implement tabletop exercises? In other words, how do we go about making our superiors see the benefits and the bigger picture? Um, I can take a stab at that. Um, the, the key is that um, I, I think it's a, a great Great point because um, you know if, if you are in the kind of a, an entry level position, you may not have the the more or less the authority to, to charter one. Um, but you know the the fact that the, the main factors around the tabletop exercise are that they're low cost and they they have a high yield in terms of face to face communication. Um, so particularly as an entry level person. Um, it can be a, a, a tremendous thing uh, to to bring this kind of thing up and to hopefully work on one. Um, but I would I would say you know uh, as with anything um, you know highlight the highlight the pluses and and the costs to uh, you know to whoever management needs to sponsor it. Um, I would also maybe um, solicit. Uh, some buy-in from lower-level folks in other parts of the organization that would be involved in it, uh, so that if if there's kind of a collective uh, group of folks that are saying, "Hey, this may be a good good way for us to spend our time to to work out some uh, some processes or some tests and procedures," um, you know, you will have number one shown the initiative, number two. Um, Taken a lot of the the hurdles away by already securing some some buy-in in other areas, um, and then cross your fingers. Uh, I don't know, Ryan. Any any other insights? Um, I I don't know if you were asking me to comment. You're coming in really muffled on my end. I, I believe the audio is good on your end. Um, the, the only thing I would say is you just got to present a logical argument. Uh, really really highlight the cost effectiveness yeah. of it and the the benefits. Uh, but trying to influence people is all about 
trying to understand what makes them tick and, and kind of what's in, what gets them excited about certain things. So if you can learn about them, I think you make it a, a, an easier argument uh, and tailor your argument to them. Yeah. And I, I would also add to that too, and, and I know Ryan has, has said this uh, a number of times to me, I, I believe it wholeheartedly as well. Um, you know, leadership is, is action, not position, and, and uh, any, any, any upper management or, or leader worth their salt wants people that have brighter ideas than they do and, and aren't afraid to, to assert them. So really would encourage, you know, um, you know, bringing it up if you, if you find a scenario that you think it would benefit um, definitely bring it up and, and uh, you know I think you'd all end up uh, looking good if, if, it, if it can uh, if it can happen and then uh, we'll, we'll get to you next Regina um, but John just wrote in the chat box uh, what is the process you use to familiarize yourself with an organization if you're being brought in as a third party to facilitate a tabletop exercise? Hey, hey Mark, I'll take this one. Um, so what we typically do uh, is we try to build partnerships with our clients. Uh, we want to understand what makes the organization tick. Uh, again, there's a lot of personalities that are involved. There's, a, there's politics that are involved. So what we try to do is we try to get into the organization, meet them face to face, uh, ask some questions, and again, just spend some time with them because you learn a lot about people just by spending time with them. Uh, but we'll also do the, the typical things, uh, ask for documentation about the organization, how it's structured, um, understanding you know, what departments are responsible for what actions, uh, and then ultimately, depending on what the exercise objectives are, say it's a, a business continuity disaster recovery uh, focused TTX, you want to look at those plans. You want to look at the documentation. You want to look at previous test results that that organization has gone through uh, because it, it's telling. It's going to give you it, it's going to give you insight into that organization. Uh, so I would say it's a combination of not only documentation review but also uh, getting to know the people that. Uh, kind of make the, the world go round in that organization. And then, Regina, do you want to ask your question? Oh, okay, my question is this. Uh, those are some really valid questions that um, are being brought up right now. I find that extremely difficult um, having worked in a hospital um, and, I, and I have a good bit of experience um, in the military as well and I understand the tabletop importance of having them and have participated in many. My question, though, is it's a different, definitely a different culture outside the military. And when you're in the healthcare environment with um, surgeons and doctors and nurses, you know, it's all about taking care of the patients. So I think it's a, a, a huge culture shift to get them to understand the investment and the importance of practicing what has not occurred yet for them. Um, and I'm wondering, and here's my true question. I'm wondering if we're pushing um, for more uh, to be part of the inspection when it comes to looking at our emergency management program and our hospital inspections like JCO, you know, things like that which I think can really push us in the right direction of the value of the tabletop exercise. I've been involved in hospital tabletop exercises in the VA. I, I currently now work for the FDA, but when I was there doing the tabletop exercise, it was more like a let's just check the block to make sure it gets done. I'm hoping that we can see a more robust tabletop exercise happen in all hospitals. You know, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but when you go from hospital to hospital, you will see dynamics where some hospitals really take it seriously and then other hospitals 
are checking the box to do the minimum. I'm just wondering if our, you know, if our our whole emergency management is really pushing for the inspection part to be involved. Uh, yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, our experience is, is very similar. Uh, we have we have clients that uh, are very mature in their processes uh, and very mature in pushing their security and privacy programs that would include tabletop exercises. Uh, I wish everybody would would take a look at this tool. Uh, to help push, you know, whatever objectives that they need to push internally in most hospitals. But, you know, we, we come across a lot of hospitals that just don't have the resources, whether it's people, uh, whether it's funding, uh, to, to do these things. They're, they're barely treading water. And I really think that starts at the, at the top in most organizations. If you have uh, boards of directors, CEOs, CIOs who, who are not as focused on it, it's going to be a real challenge. And, and really, you just got to push. You just got to keep on pushing uh, to try to get them to understand. Uh, sometimes you, you're going to be successful, and sometimes you won't. I mean, we 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 look to do this for every one of our clients, um, but it sometimes it's just not in the cards. And all you can keep on doing is just trying to demonstrate the value, and and hopefully they'll come around to it. And and I do think that uh, the healthcare industry is starting to uh, open their eyes a little bit more. You know, HIPAA and high tech, uh, you know, they, they've done a good job in drawing attention, but I think in the last, say, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, the amount of public breaches uh, have really started to draw some attention to what are we doing? Are we being a check the block type of organization, or do we have a proactive security program that, that includes emergency management and, and incident management? So I think you, you might see, hopefully, uh, that the industry is starting to take a turn to, to pay more attention to this, and, and, and it will gain some traction because, uh, you know, you, Mark, and I, we, we've seen the successes that TTXs can can have on in our military experience. Uh, I just we just know that it can be spread across the board, and, and that's ultimately why we wanted to do this. Is we're just trying to get people educated on on the the successes of it and the benefits of it. And yeah, I, I would just add to that too um, that y you're absolutely right. There are um, varying degrees of, of buy-in and support, um, and, and we see that, as Ryan said, from you know one client to another. Um, and in in building a uh, a, a security program, um, one of the first things that it starts with is is the you know involvement of uh, Areas outside of IT, um, you know, security is really a holistic problem. It's, a, it's an organizational problem, uh, and so those organizations that, that engage in these things and that um, you know are in better shape are the ones that do have uh, some of the buy-in from different functional areas. And you know, same you know, in hospitals, you know, the physician uh, the physician input is is a very strong uh, input, and so. If you have a if you have a client where that's supportive, uh, then you're going to have a better result. Um, but I think where um, one way to continually overcome the challenges is to is through awareness. Um, and and you know we we scratch the surface on the types of security uh, risks that are out there, particularly for healthcare. Um, but uh, I've been in many a room where. Non-IT folks, uh, you know, eyebrows get raised quite a bit um, when we when we kind of share this type of information. So, um, you know, one of the things we use to to help battle that is just continual awareness and by staying on top of what's going on in the industry and kind of getting it back to our clients to to help them understand, um, you know, kind of the urgency of the issue. And sometimes we're successful, and sometimes we're not. Thank you, everybody. Um, it looks like we're getting close to running out of time now. So 
if anybody has any other questions, um, you can always um, I can always get you Mark and Ryan's email, and you can shoot it their way. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any other questions you have um, through email. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for attending today, and I really want to thank uh, Mark and Ryan for taking the time out of their um, busy schedules and coming here and um, letting me know, sit into um, the insights of tabletop exercises. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>